Okay, so we're gonna have uh, two more talks before the lunch break. Uh, we're gonna start with uh, Isa talk. Uh, before I guess I uh, let let uh, Isa to give his talk. I'll briefly uh, introduce him. So Isa is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at the American University of Beirut. Uh, his research interests are in application acceleration um, and programming support for emerging parallel processors and memory technologies, a particular interest in GPUs, uh, film processing in memory. Uh, Isat received his uh, master's and PhD in electrical and computer engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana Campaign, uh, where he received the Danby Valley Endo Fellowship as well. Uh, prior to that, he received his bachelor's in electrical and computer engineering at the American University of Beirut, where he is now a, a assistant professor. Um, and he also received a distinguished uh, graduate award there when, when he's, well, he was with his bachelor's. So I guess with that, uh, we can take it away. Uh, is that? Okay, thank you, John, for the introduction, and uh, thank you all for attending. It's a pleasure to, to join you, and sorry that I had to join in the remote. Um, uh, so I'll be talking today about uh, a framework that we built uh, for high throughput sequence alignment using real processing memory systems. Um, the framework is called AIM. Uh, it was uh, developed uh, primarily by my master's students, Safat, Tia, uh, with the help of Amir, and also in collaboration with Hamad Juan and Toner from uh, ETH. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, all of them for uh, their efforts in making this work possible. Um, so I, I'm not going to motivate uh, why sequence line is important. I think this audience um, already knows that, and, uh, and prior talks have already motivated that. Uh, but I'll start by commenting on some of the uh, kind of performance bottlenecks that uh, sequence launch faces, especially on traditional processors like CPUs. Um, so here, this plot shows how uh, the execution time, which is on the y-axis, uh, scales with the number of threads um, on the CPU for different algorithms. So I'm showing five different algorithms here. Uh, I'm going to launch the port go to genes and WFA WFA adapted, um, and then also. Um, uh, also, uh, uh, with uh, different treatment models. So, every line in this plot refers to different treatment. Um, and here, what we can see is that as the uh, as number of threads increases, we see that there is a limited performance uh, improvement beyond a certain point. So, from kind of improves from one thread down to 16 threads, but then there's kind of stagnation and we see little improvement beyond that. Um, and when we investigated why, we found that. Um, uh, as we increase the number of threads, uh, the instructions per cycle, uh, which is the number of instructions that the thread executes every cycle, uh, is steady up until 16 threads, but then it also starts to drop, which means that as we are increasing the number of threads that are executing, these threads are becoming more and more idle. Um, and, and when we looked into why, uh, so there's uh, more time to spend by each thread's idle, meaning these threads are just sitting there and stalling, they're not doing it useful. Um, so when we looked at why these threads are stalling, uh, we saw that as the number of threads increase, uh, we saw that there's an increase in the number of memory stalls. So there's, these threads are spending more and more time waiting for memory, uh, meaning that we're adding these threads, but these threads aren't able to make as much progress um, as when there were fewer threads because they're not competing for the memory, and, and, and so each thread has to wait a longer time for memory. And this is known as the uh, memory bandwidth bottleneck. Uh, so in conventional CPU processing, we have a CPU chip, right, which uh, has different cores, and these cores are where we execute computations. Uh, and these cores access data from the memory chip, which uh, has a bunch of UM banks, uh, and then store the data. Uh, and um, the, the, and uh, the more and more threads we have executed on the chip, uh, uh, the more and more data is, uh, is going to be uh, requested by these threads. Uh, and what this does is creates a bottleneck for uh, for the data when it tries to, when it tries to go from the memory chip uh, to the CPU chip where the computation is being done. Uh, now, if uh, for applications that uh, do a lot of computations for, uh, for every data that they access, that's not a big deal. But uh, because uh, if they have many threads, still they're not we're not going to have too many each data being processed at the same time. Uh, but for applications such as sequence alignments that don't do a lot of computations for unit data, uh, the memory bandwidth bottleneck becomes a big issue. Uh, so uh, an important solution to this uh, problem that uh, is kind of gaining a lot of attention in the literature is processing in memory. Uh, and so processing in memory is this idea that uh, if we have a 
computation that does not uh, does not use uh, um, that does not reuse data a lot. It's not very computer intensive. It's more memory intensive. That instead of bringing the data all the way to the compute chip uh, to uh, perform computation, perform a few computations on it. Instead, uh, what we will do is we will put these weaker cores inside of the memory chip. Uh, these temp cores, processing memory cores, and we will process the data where the memory, um, we will process the data where it resides, or closer to where it resides. Uh, and what this does, it helps us overcome this memory balance bottleneck so that the computation is no longer memory bound. Um, now, there's uh, there's been a lot of uh, work on processing memory. There's been some hardware, uh, real hardware that was manufactured. There's also a lot of research, uh, research prototypes. Uh, and what we've done is we've been looking at um, um, performing sequence alignment on real pin hardware, and specifically we've looked at UpMAM, which is the first real pin hardware that has been made available. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how the UpMAM system is organized, and then I'll talk about how our framework uh, has sort of been designed to target the UpMAM system. Uh, so the UpMAM system, uh, designed by uh, uh, the company that designed this called UpMAM, um, so in, in an UpMAM system, you have a host CPU, uh, and this host CPU has a, a bunch of uh, DRAM things. Every DRAM has a bunch of DRAM chips. Uh, the, and each chip has a bunch of DRAM banks. Um, so this is the usual main memory that you will find in a system. But then also, in addition to these DIMMs, you have these processing and memory enabled uh, DIMMs. So here, uh, these are special DIMMs uh, where, with each uh, inside of each uh, each DIMM, you have again a bunch of chips. These are called PIM chips, and inside of each PIM chip, you have uh, you have these DRAM banks, but these DRAM banks are special in that they also have processing and memory capabilities. And this is kind of what it, uh, what these DIMMs look like in real, in real life. They're, they're kind of standard, uh, standard uh, DRAM chips that you can plug into a system, but they have the, 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 the DRAM banks have the capability of executing uh, operations. Uh, so let me, uh, let me kind of zoom in into one of these PIM chips. So the PIM chip is going to have multiple uh, uh, what we what is more called DPUs or data processing units, and each DPU is going to have a 64 megabyte DRAM bank. Uh, but then also in addition to having the DRAM bank, it's going to have some additional hardware that allows it to execute computations on the data in that bank. So there's a DMA engine that can take data from that DRAM bank and stream it to a kind of faster uh, uh, SRAM based. Uh, um, uh, cache, or which is smaller, 64 kilobytes, and this is called WRAM. And then, and then there's also an instruction RAM that's also 24 kilobytes, more like an SRAM, uh, SRAM uh, type of memory. Uh, and then these uh, are, can be accessed by a, a a computation core that can perform computations. So this core is a, is a kind of RISC-V processor uh, that has 14 pipeline stages. Um, and to fully, one important note is to fully utilize this processor, you need to have at least 11 threads running. Um, otherwise, uh, there's going to be stalls uh, because this because this processor has kind of a limited capability of handling um, of uh, of handling hazards. So uh, because of uh, because they these can uh, be kept simple, so that it doesn't consume too much area inside of the uh, chip. Uh, so this is how uh, these uh, these upmap chips are organized. Uh, again, every every uh, every member DRAM bank uh, is coupled with this core that can uh, that can execute computation with the data in that DRAM. Uh, and uh, to, uh, to execute data, the data needs to be streamed from the DRAM bank uh, to this working RAM, and then the core will, will perform the operations on the data of the working RAM. Um, so now I'm going to talk about uh, how we've targeted this hardware uh, with our framework for performing sequence alignment. Uh, so our framework is called AIM, uh, Alignment and Memory, uh, and AIM uh, works as follows. Uh, the first uh, step uh, in uh, the workflow is to uh, get uh, sequence pairs uh, from an input file or maybe from somewhere else and bring them into the host memory of the CPU. Uh, the next step is we take these sequence pairs and we distribute them across all the different DPUs. So these, I think, again, a DPU is this coupling of a DRAM bank with a core that can execute uh, on uh, on the data that you um, So uh, so we distribute these sequence pairs across these different DPUs, and then inside of every DPU, uh, we first stream the data from the MRAM to the WRAM. Uh, 
to talk a little bit in a little more detail about this process in a later slide. Uh, and then after we bring the data into the data into WRAM, uh, we have the threads. That we can have many threads executing inside the same core, so we could, so every thread is handling sending its own data from the MRAM to WRAM. And then also every thread will uh, access WRAM to perform its own sequence alignment. And then when the threads are done, they do the trace back, of course. Uh, they, uh, the threads will store um, uh, the result uh, back into the MRAM. Uh, and then after we are done, uh, uh, the CPU will bring the data from the MRAM to the host main memory, and then this data will be stored uh, back uh, to this. Uh, one thing to note here is that uh, there's a necessary step of putting things in the main memory of the host CPU uh, and then uh, moving them to the PIM, mem PIM enabled memory. And then same thing, you have to move it back from the PIM enabled memory to the host CPU before you can store it to this. Uh, this is a limitation of the current hardware that, of course, incurs an additional data transfer. I'm going to show uh, uh, how that impacts performance uh, in, in the evaluation. Uh, so this is the uh, this is the overall workflow of our framework game. Uh, we support different algorithms uh, inside of the game. We support uh, the well-known Lieberman Walsh algorithm, also the Smith Waterman Go to algorithm, which uh, supports uh, the affine gap model. Uh, we also support Jeanette, which is, um, uh, which is uh, based on bitwise uh, operations to perform alignment instead of the usual which is Smith Waterman Go to. Uh, uh, I believe Dabla is going to be presenting uh, on Genesis, so I won't talk too much about it in my presentation. Uh, and then finally, we, um, we also look at uh, the wavefront algorithm, which is a state of the art, uh, uh, which is a state of the art uh, sequence line algorithm based on uh, based on wavefronts. Uh, so here, logically, you all, you have this uh, this uh, dynamic programming matrix that you uh, that you operate on, similar to the form of go to, uh, but instead you actually store you actually kind of uh, uh, op operate on it kind of one way front at a time, where every way front corresponds to like an incremental uh, a score that until you reach the uh, until you reach the uh, uh, kind of the, the, the bottom left, bottom right of the matrix. And the idea here is to avoid exploring the whole matrix um, if you, um, if, uh, if if that is unnecessary for you to kind of find the, the alignment score. Um, so what we've done uh, is we've uh, implemented uh, all four of these algorithms for WFA. We've implemented two versions of it: uh, uh, the the regular version and also the heuristic version, we we'll call WFA adaptive. Uh, and we've evaluated them on uh, on uh, uh, the optimum system. Uh, now, one important thing in uh, uh, in implementing these algorithms on optimum is managing the optimum memory hierarchy uh, because you have this. Uh, this uh, DRAM bank, and then we also have the working RAM, which the core accesses in the working RAM is smaller, but it's faster. Uh, you have to manually manage the uh, uh, the data the data movement between the WRAM and the MRAM. So for every uh, see, for every algorithm, we actually have two different versions of the algorithm. One of them uh, uses WRAM only for storing the alignment data structures. By the alignment data structures, I mean uh, the dynamic programming matrix for the Lumen launch, for example, or um, or the wavefront components for the wavefront algorithm. Um, so here, <coughs> excuse me. So in the WRAM version, uh, what we do is uh, we put the sequence pairs in MRAM. Uh, MRAM again is the, the large uh, the large DRAM bank. So we put the sequence pairs in MRAM. We bring those into the, uh, and the thread uh, that's operating on a sequence pair will bring them one sequence pair at a time into WRAM and have its own section in WRAM that it's responsible for, that, that where it can put its data. Uh, and then it'll, uh, it'll also store the, the intermediate alignment data structures, so like the DP matrix, for example, inside of the WRAM entirely. It'll do the alignment, uh, store the result, and then write back the result, uh, the alignment result to MRAM, uh, which will be later transferred to the CPU. So here, the, the key idea is that we're replacing the entire intermediate alignment data structure inside of the WRAM. Now, because the WRAM is uh, limited in capacity, it's 64 kilobytes, whereas this MRAM is 64 megabytes, uh, this uh, places a restriction on how many threads we can support. Uh, and as the sequences that we're aligning get larger, these data structures get larger, so we can support fewer and fewer PIM threads. Uh, and because of that, we have another version Oops. Uh, because of that, we have another version of uh, the uh, uh, 
uh, of the, uh, the FBLM algorithm, which uses both WRAP and MRAP for the uh, determining alignment data structures. So in this case, what, what happens is, again, we have the sequence pairs inside of the MRAM, but we're also going to put the entire alignment data structures also inside of MRAM. So here the DP matrix and even more, for example, with wavefront components and WFA, uh, these will be inside of MRAM. Uh, and when, what the threads uh, are going to do is that when they're aligning a sequence pair, uh, depending on where they are the alignment, they're going to bring in only part of the data structure that they need for the current step of the alignment. So, for example, uh, in the human launch, it's only going to bring in a certain set of anti points, or in WFA, it's going to only bring in a certain set of uh, wavefront components. It's not going to have all wavefront components stored inside of the WRAM. And what this does is that it allows us to use less, uh, less uh, WRAM per thread, which allows us to execute more threads on the DPU, which again is important because. We, we, need to be, we need to execute 11 threads simultaneously if we would like to fully utilize uh, the PIM cores. Um, uh, so, so, this, so these are the two different versions that we provide uh, for each algorithm. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, show some results uh, that our framework has achieved. Uh, I'll start by comparing uh, our framework, uh, uh, executing the PIM, uh, specifically on PIM, to uh, some CPU implementations. Um, first, uh, so we compared three different CPUs um, uh, with a different, a varying number of threads, also a varying, a varying sizes of, uh, of cache. And one thing that we note is that uh, the CPU that has the largest L3 cache, in this case the Xeon 5, uh, also tends to be the best performing CPU in the majority of cases. Uh, and, uh, and this observation, again, uh, emphasizes the fact that this is indeed a, a memory-bound computation. Because we have a CPU that has you know, more threads, um, but uh, the CPU that has fewer threads and a larger cache ended up performing better um, because uh, it was better at dealing with this memory value of this computation. Uh, so our, our second observation, uh, so here the, the, the edit, this, uh, this, uh, this additional gold bar represents uh, the perf uh, execution time uh, on upman. Uh, so again, I, excuse me, I forgot to introduce the plots. So we have execution time on the y-axis, so lower is better. Uh, we have different algorithms here, and WS before we go to and WFA, WFA adaptive. And then over here, we have different read length. Um, so as you can see, uh, in the case of UpNet, in the majority of cases, uh, this, this gold bar is lower than the blue bar, so it shows that the PIM performance is uh, better than uh, the, uh, the CPU performance. Uh, and for in the best case, uh, for some of we go to, our performance is up to 4x faster uh, or 4x higher throughput than uh, uh, the CPU. Uh, WFA is, uh, is up to 1.8x uh, faster, and WFA adapter is up to 2.5x uh, faster. So again, uh, we see that uh, PIM can substantially outperform the CPU uh, because of its ability to overcome the, this memory band of um, and now this, uh, this gold bar includes uh, data transfer. Remember I said at the beginning that we have to move data into the CPU's main memory and then move it from the CPU main memory to the PIM, uh, to the PIM enabled memory. Um, so if we, look at, uh, if we look at results without data transfer, we see that the performance improves even more. Uh, we can have up to 25 uh, or 26x uh, faster for WFA and 28 times faster for WFA adapter. Uh, now, why why is this result without data transfer important? Uh, so, like I said before, we have this uh, limitation of having to put things in main memory and then transfer them from main memory to the MRAM. And at the same time, when we're done, we have to move things from MRAM back to main memory and then write them back to this. Now, in a future system, if uh, if these um, if these PIM memories improved uh, and became more advanced and were capable of supporting uh, writing directly uh, to the uh, to the uh, these PIM enabled DIMs, uh, potentially we could uh, write things directly from this to the these PIM uh, memories and then write things directly from these PIM memories back to the disk, and that will save us this data transfer, which will allow us to have even more uh, performance improvement from uh, from being able to process them. Uh, the final observation from this plot is that uh, uh, we have, uh, for, for the algorithms that are, have regular accesses, like the Moon Motions and Waterman, and then also for the cases where we have small read lengths, 
we see that the CPU actually outperforms uh, PIM in these cases. Uh, and that's expected because when the read lengths are small, the data structures are small, so the memory bandwidth is less of an issue. And also when the axes are regular, the, the CPU cache tends to be good at dealing with those. Um, so again, it helps, uh, it helps uh, with the memory bandwidth. Uh, so where we really see uh, the biggest improvements are when we have the, the more irregular memory axes coming from the from these uh, the algorithms like W. Um, uh, we also scale to larger read lengths, so here you can see that uh, we continue to have a large speed ups for, you know, at a distance up to 5%, and also for read lengths of 5,000 and 10,000. Uh, we have one uh, case here where we, uh, where our framework begins to uh, struggle with outperforming the CPU, uh, and what's happening over here is that we are limited by the WRAM capacity we can execute. So here the issue is in memory bandwidth, it becomes the memory capacity that's available to a single BPU core. So what's happening here is that, uh, if you remember here, uh, we were storing uh, these data the, these data structures in WRAM, uh, or in MRAM, and storing parts of it in WRAM. So uh, what happens is, is when the sequences get very large, even the small component of the data structure that we would like to store becomes so large that the WRAM becomes insufficient for storage, so we end up having only one thread executed in this situation. So we underutilize the PIM core. So that's well, that's what's happening over here, um, and hopefully, you know, in the future, we plan to overcome this uh, by kind of um, being kind of more fine-grained in how we move data between MRAM and WRAM, and also potentially parallelizing sequence alignment across more PIM threads to be able to utilize uh, the, uh, the, the 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 DPU pipeline more effectively. Uh, we also compare performance to uh, GPUs. So here you can see, uh, compared to WFA uh, implement and a WFA implementation on GPU, uh, you can see that uh, in most cases, uh, PIM outperforms the GPU and we have higher throughput. And here you can see that uh, the throughput improvement in most cases is high, up to 2.68 times faster uh, for the for the uh, large sequence. Um, uh, we also uh, uh, this is my final plot I'm going to show. Uh, here we compare, remember I talked about how we have uh, two different versions of each algorithm, one of them that only uses WRAM for the intermediate data structures, and one of them that uses both. Uh, so, uh, um, so here you can see that um, in some cases, uh, the WRAM version is better. In other cases, I'm going to kind of um, you know, speed up just to avoid uh, running fluid over time. In some cases, the WRAM version, orange one, uh, is lower, so it's better. And then in some cases, uh, you see that uh, there's kind of a trade off. So for small read lengths, the WRAM only version is better, and for large read lengths, the MRAM uh, version becomes better. Uh, so this again shows the importance of providing these multiple algorithms, uh, and our framework uh, supposed to support both. Uh, so to summarize, uh, uh, we, uh, you know, we showed that sequence alignment on traditional systems is limited by the memory bandwidth bottleneck. Something in memory overcomes this bottleneck, uh, and our framework alignment in memory is a PIM framework that supports different alignment algorithms and is implemented on UpMem, which is the first real PIM system. Uh, our results show that we have substantial speedups over CPUs and GPUs. Uh, and uh, you can access uh, our source code uh, at this GitHub link, and this work was also published uh, by Informatics very recently. Uh, so thank you, uh, and uh, I'll be happy to take this. Excellent, yeah, thanks, thanks, Isad. Uh, I guess we have some time for questions at the moment. Yeah, thanks, Isad. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, since the data transfer is also causing a problem here, do you think you can do further computation within the PIM core uh, before moving the end result to the CPU back? Uh, for example, you can do the further steps like variant calling and some other st uh, stuff because uh, you're going to filter out some of these results and maybe you don't need to move them anymore to the CPU back to do further analyses. I'm not sure if uh, those PIM cores allow for that. Do you have more space to do m further computation? For example, reducing the parallelism instead of uh, leveraging all these cores uh, for alignment, you could reduce that. Some of them do alignment, some of them do some other stuff. What is your uh, takeaway uh, about that? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Right. But so uh, here in our experimental setup and our evaluation, we've um, we kind of just, we kind of sent sent the the reads to do the alignment and then brought them back. But you're absolutely right. Like if we have if we're going to integrate this framework into kind of a, a larger workflow, potentially the previous step or the next step can also be done in the PIM course. And in this case, we'll be doing more work in the PIM course, uh, which will allow you to amortize that data transfer overhead. So, so absolutely, that's um, um, if, if the previous and next steps are also memory bound steps, uh, doing them in the PIM course is, is, um, is a good idea. Um, it depends, of course, how much, uh, how much, uh, Global communication needs to happen uh, for these previous and next steps because these PIM, these PIM systems are not very good, or at least this one is not very good at communicating across PIM cores. But if some previous or next step is embarrassingly parallel and can be done locally in the PIM core, um, that 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 that's absolutely right. That can uh, that can be done. Uh, another another thing that uh, can be done to hide the um, the, uh, the this data transfer is that if a subsequent step is happening on the CPU, uh, instead of waiting until you're done and then doing the data transfer and then executing on the CPU, you can pipeline that. So uh, what you would do is you would kind of do some alignments and then transfer them to the CPU uh, and, and then kind of paralyze the transfer to the CPU with the computation of the CPU so that transfer becomes hidden by the computation. Um, so if you set up a pipeline like that, uh, the transfer time will affect you less and less. I see. I think that is a great point about the intercommunication issue between the PEM cores. I didn't think about it. Yeah, I see. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you for your question. Thank you very much, Isaac, for the great talk. Uh, I also have a question for you. I'm Juan from ETH. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, my question, because the results that you showed are for different uh, read lengths and different uh, edit distance uh, values, right? So how would AIM uh, handle the case where you have different lengths, for example? Imagine that you have a variety of uh, reads between 100 uh, characters and 500. So how, how would uh, the the framework itself would deal with this situation, or how it could be, it could be, let's say, improved to handle that well. Yeah, so it it, um, it depends on the uh, it depends on the algorithms. So some of the algorithms um, are not really affected by uh, by uh, by the error rate, um, but uh, algorithms like WFA, for example, um, you know, they, the 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 uh, how how much error rate you have impacts how much memory you can, uh, how much memory you need to allocate. So if you have to deal with reads that have higher and higher error rate, you're going to need to have more and more memory to be able, because you're going to have more waveform components that you need to store. Uh, so in that case, uh, because of the limited, uh, because of the limited memory capacity, um, the, the error rate does become an issue. Uh, and, um, um, uh, and, and, and if you have kind of variable error rates, you're going to have to Dynamically adapt to those uh, those error rates as you're executing. Now our implementation does um, does handle that to some extent. Um, however, kind of um, uh, failing gracefully when you have very high error rates is something that kind of we still need to be able to support. Right now, we just kind of uh, uh, we just kind of are unable to handle the situation if we have very high error. But doing um, more more intelligent things like maybe. Stopping one of the uh, one of the alignments so that another stopping one of the threads so that the other thread can use its memory. Um, that's something that can be done, but that's not something that we currently do uh, in our framework. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, thank you very much, Isat. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks again, Isat. Yeah. Thanks. Our next speaker is uh, Nika. Uh, I guess while she gets uh, her setup ready, uh, I can start introducing her. Okay, I can already see her. Cool. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so Nika is uh, going to give the next talk, uh, Janstor. Uh, Nika is a PhD student in Safari Research Group at ETH Zurich, uh, where he she also got uh, her master's uh, at ETH. 
uh, before uh, she got her uh, bachelor's from University of Tehran and uh, during uh, her PhD she's currently working on uh, mainly like uh, emerging uh, memory and processing technologies uh, focusing on uh, let's say bioinformatics workloads and also uh, doing near data processing and uh, processing in memory, uh, storage systems, etc. Uh, so I think Jan's story summarizes a uh, part of uh, her PhD uh, uh, work, let's say. So I guess without uh, further ado, uh, Nika, we can start, I guess. Okay, yeah, thanks, Jan. Do you hear me well? Yes. Okay, and I guess the screen is also shared, right, correctly? Exactly, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, hello, as uh, Jen mentioned, I am Nika, and today I will talk about GenStore, a high performance and storage processing system for genome sequence analysis. Uh, genome sequence analysis is critical for many applications, such as personalized medicine, outbreak tracing, and evolutionary studies. In genome sequencing machines extract the smaller fragments of the original DNA sequences known as reads. Read mapping, as uh, probably I have, uh, it has already been discussed uh, in this session, is a, one of the first key steps in genome sequence analysis that aligns reads to potential matching locations within the reference genome. And for each matching location, the alignment step tries to find uh, the degree of similarity between the read and the reference genome by calculating the alignment score. Calculating the alignment score requires computationally expensive approximate string matching, or NSM, to account for differences between the read and uh, the reference genome. Uh, read mapping performs alignment on large genomic data sets containing millions of reads, and therefore read mapping is both computationally expensive and incurs high data movement overhead. There's a significant effort into improving read mapping performance through efficient heuristics, hardware accelerators, and various filters that prune reads that do not require expensive computation. But these approaches either say computation overhead in mapping and data movement uh, overhead in um, uh, memory and main memory and cache hierarchy. Uh, none of them alleviate the data movement overhead from storage system whose impact becomes even larger when other uh, overheads get alleviated. Our key idea is to filter reads that do not require expensive alignment computation in the storage system to fundamentally reduce data movement overhead of read mapping throughout the system. Examples of reads that would not uh, require a costly alignment step would be exactly matching reads to the reference genome uh, that do not need approximate string matching performed during the alignments, and non matching reads that have no potential matching locations in the reference genome, and then uh, hence they can skip the alignment step. Uh, However, filtering reads in a modern SSD can be challenging because of different behavior across read mapping workloads and the limited hardware resources that we have available uh, in the storage system. So by addressing these challenges, we propose GenStore, which is the first storage processing system designed for genome sequence analysis to reduce both the computation uh, overhead and the data movement overhead from the storage system. And just to provide uh, high performance and energy benefits compared to state-of-the-art hardware and software placements. So that was a, a summary and overview of my talk. Let's just start with some background on read mapping so we can dive into the talk in more detail. Um, so mapping reads to reference genome requires expensive computation on large data sets as we talked about. And the search space in the reference genome can actually be very large. For example, for the human reference genome, this can contain more than uh, 3 billion characters. So uh, usually read mappers use an index of their reference genome to reduce the search, search space. And this index contains unique k length subsequence of this called k-mers extracted from the reference genome and the location of these k-mers uh, in the reference genome. Um, read mapping is uh, usually uh, can considered as a three-step process. And the state of the art read mappers involve several heuristics to reduce the cost of expensive alignment computation. In the first step, uh, seeding, the mapper determines the potential matching locations or seeds in the large reference genome where the read could map. And to do so, 
uh, the number of strengths some chimeras out of the read looks at the uh, location of these uh, chimeras inside the index, and if the chimera um, hits, it marks these potential candidate locations as seeds or um, potential matching locations. So basically, these are locations in the first genome that need to be further looked at. Um, so to further reduce the cost of uh, computation in expensive alignment, the read mapper performs a second step called chain or seed filtering, in which the mapper prunes the seeds in the reference genome to which the reads would not align, using a simple approximation of the alignment score. At the end of this step, the reads that have other locations filtered out can skip the third step. For the remaining reads, the third step, which is the costly alignment step, determines the uh, exact differences and similarities between a read and uh, the reference genome via approximate string matching operations. So uh, we performed experimental studies to understand the potential of efficient and storage filters for improving read mapping performance. We performed a case study on real-world genomic read datasets on various read mapping systems and the state-of-the-art SSD configurations. And we make several observations as I will summarize now. The ideal in storage filter can significantly improve performance by reducing the computation overhead and data movement overhead. Filtering outside SSD provides relatively lower performance benefits because it does not reduce the data movement overhead from SSD storage systems, uh, basically overall, and uh, also compete with read mapping for system resources, such as SSD's external bandwidth and main memory bandwidth and computation resources. We also observed that hardware accelerators reduce the computation bottleneck significantly, and uh, that makes I.O. a larger bottleneck in the system. So motivated by these observations, our goal is to design an storage filter uh, for a genome sequence analysis in a cost-effective manner. And we have three key uh, design objectives in uh, mind when designing this new system. So the first is that the system should provide high in storage filtering performance to overlap filtering with the read mapping of unfiltered data. And second, the design should support reads with different properties and different degrees of genetic variation. And third, it should not require a significant additional hardware overhead. And to this end, we propose GenStore, which is the first uh, storage processing system designed for genome sequence analysis. Our key idea is to filter reads that does not, do, do not require the alignment step inside the storage system and send the unfiltered data to the whole system for further processing. However, filtering reads in a modern SSD can be challenging because of different uh, read mapping behaviors for different workloads and the limited hardware resources that we have available there. Uh, so let's look at filtering opportunities based on the features of input read sets. So sequencing machines uh, produce one of two kinds of reads. So short reads, which are highly accurate and short, and long reads that are relatively less accurate uh, but much lar larger. So short trees can be up to feed all characters, and long reads can be hundreds to millions of DNA characters. And based on these, um, we leverage two filtering opportunities for reads that do not require the expensive alignment step. First, we can uh, filter exactly matching reads, which are reads that match exactly to uh, one or more subsequences of the reference genome and do not require um, approximate string matching during the alignment. Uh, examples of these ones would be uh, frequently occurring in short read sets with uh, low sequencing error rates and also low genetic variation. And non-matching reads uh, are the second class, so these can do not have any potential matching location in the reference genome and therefore they can skip the alignment step. And non-matching reads can occur in long read sets that have high sequencing errors or uh, on shorter long read sets that have high degree of uh, genetic variation. By thorough analysis of mapping process of reads with different properties and different degrees of uh, genetic variation, we designed two low-cost storage filters. First is Jester EN for filtering exactly my and the second is just QM for filtering non matching reads. So now let's take a closer look at just or EM. Uh, just or EM accelerates read mapping by using an efficient and storage filter to filter reads that have uh, at least one exactly matching location in the reference genome 
but uh, simple operations are without requiring alignment. But the key challenge in designing the um, in designing GenStore EM is the large number of random access to to large data structures inside the SSD. So as I have shown in the background slide, we need to look up a large index and the reference genome um, uh, in random places. So that can be challenging uh, when from inside the storage because uh, NAND flash memory exhibits very poor performance for uh, random access reads compared to uh, more efficient streaming accesses, sequential streaming accesses. And there's a limited DRAM capacity inside uh, the SSD, which is relatively um, smaller compared to the size of data structures that we need to randomly access. So to reduce the number of these accesses per read, we introduce read size k-mers. So instead of extracting several k-mers per read, as I have shown again in the background slide, and perform uh, separate lookups for each of these individual k-mers, uh, we can use the whole read as one gamer, so hence that's the concept of read-sized gamers. So we can only have one lookup per read. So that's how we reduce the number of accesses. So now that we already know where we would access for each read, because the whole read is one gamer, we can avoid random accesses to the index by introducing the concept of the sorted uh, index of these read-sized gamers. So, um, we don't have several cameras, we don't need to look several places, um, so we can already sort all the uh, uh, based on uh, how, um, how they appear. Uh, so this index, uh, sorted index allows finding exact matches via a simple um, sequential scanning of the link set and the index. So now I want to show the key idea of just the EM with a simplified example in which short read uh, consists of 10 characters. Uh, as I said, they can go up to a few hundred characters. So for this I'm showing a uh, um, 10 characters. So now suppose we have two data structures. One is the sorted read table, uh, and each entry of it is, uh, stores a read and its unique ID, and uh, the sorted kmer index, which contains all unique read size kmers extracted from the reference genome, along with the kmer's corresponding location in the reference genome. So similar to what we had uh, before, just kmers are having similar size as they So each data structure is sorted by read and kmer. This is done in alphabetical order. Uh, so we sequentially scan through these data structures in three different ways based on the uh, comparison result of the current read and kmer. Uh, so let's go through these uh, three ways, see what happens. So first, when this current read and kmer are identical, we report the read as an exactly matching read that can be filtered from further read mapping process, and then uh, we move to the next element in both of these arrays. So if the read is alphabetically larger than the camera, we conclude that the camera does not match any read because we would have otherwise um, encountered uh, the matching ones since we've been sequentially scanning. So we go to the next element in the index so we can examine the uh, uh, next camera. Okay, here, so if the camera is alphabetically larger than the read, we conclude that the read does not match any camera in the index and needs to be sent to um, the full uh, read mapping process, wherever it's happening. Uh, then uh, we go to the next element in the sort of table, so we can examine the next read. So using this technique, JSTOR EM avoids random accesses and performs filtering only using low-cost uh, logic. Despite the key benefits of the approach I just discussed, or sorted read-sized uh, camera index, this index takes up a large space, so it can be 126 gigs per human index due to the large number of unique k uh, gamers and the fact that we need to store these big gamers. So we reduce the size of the uh, capacity overhead of this genstorium index by replacing the read size gamers with a strong uh, hash value of each read. It can act as uh, both a sorting criteria, so instead of alphabetic sorting, we can sort based on the hash values and um, it can be as a fingerprint of each entry. Uh, so, using 
strong hash values instead of weak size kangaroos reduces the size of the uh, index by 3.9 times. But this indices is still larger than the baseline k-mean index used in conventional drink mappers. Um, but our proposal is feasible for its storage processing due to the large capacity and high internal bandwidth of modern and flash-based SSDs because then we can uh, stream through these with high bandwidth efficiently. Now I uh, show the overall operation flow of Jester EVM. Be it a sorted read table and sorted chamber index, uh, as I call them in these figures, SR table and escape index, in the NAND flash memory distributed across <laughs> all channels and dies, and the comparator. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so this is distributed evenly so that we can leverage the full internal bandwidth of the SSD. And we have the comparator logic on the SSD controller. And uh, we have two steps. So first is uh, in step one reads, uh, just or even reads the uh, two data structures from NAND flash chips to the SSD's internal DRAM in a batched manner. And the step two, uh, so as you see, these are the batches inside the DRAM. Uh, and step two performs exact match filtering within each read batch using simple comparator logic. Step one and two are performed in a pipeline manner, and therefore during filtering, just or EM can send the unfiltered reads to the whole system for full read mapping. So this way the filtering can concurrently happen inside the SSD, and as soon as we have reads that need uh, more complex read mapping, we can go uh, to the whole system or any other. Right. So it's with that we have some number from big mapping. Now let's take a closer look at Genstore NM for filtering non-matching reads. Using uh, chaining, uh, which um, was the second step in uh, high-level read mapping steps that I discussed in the background, uh, Genstore NM filters most of the non-matching reads, which are reads that would not align to any subsequences under the French genome. We call that uh, chaining filter calculates a similarity score for each read called chain score and filters reads uh, with no high scoring potential in matching location. But calculating the chaining score inside the SSC can be challenging because finding the best chaining score requires performing many iterations of the dynamic programming algorithm for all seats um, within a read. Um, so the scan particularly be challenging for long reads because they can have um, really long lengths and uh, large numbers of um, uh, kamers per read. So performing uh, many iterations of this time programming algorithm in them uh, would require a lot of uh, buffering space and other resources, uh, which is expensive for uh, tool for inside the SSD. So to reduce the cost of chaining, Genstore NM uses a lightweight chaining filter to selectively perform chaining only on reads with a small number of seeds and directly sends reads that require more complex chaining to the host system. This idea is based on observation from analyzing the wide range of real world genomic data sets. Uh, so as you see in this figure, uh, we see the probability alignment probability of Burry and long that data set to subsequences in the reference genome as a function of a number of seeds per read. And we observe that reads with sufficiently large number of seeds are very likely to align to subsequences in the reference genome, and uh, such reads can be directly sent to the CPU for full read mapping. And they can um, uh, bypass the in storage filter. Okay, I have uh, something in the chat, maybe I can... Okay, thanks, John, for the reminder. About the time. Okay. Uh, okay, we observed that it's with a uh, sufficiently large number of scenes are related to align to subsequences in the different genome, and they can be directly sent to CPU for full read mapping while passing the storage filter. Um, so, we conclude that, uh, uh -huh, yeah, so therefore, just using a very simple chain, uh, filter for the bits that um, have few seeds can uh, already filter many of non aligning bits without needing costly hardware resources inside the SSC. And we conclude that um, uh, 
um, this already can uh, lead to a uh, small hunter overhead while uh, providing most of the gains of chain filter. And more details of uh, this can be found in the paper uh, about the just randomness design. Now I'll go to the results. So we evaluate the following systems based, which is the CWR software or hardware read mappers for both short and long reads. And GS is base integrated with GenStore. So it can be a different hardware or software mapper integrated with GenStore, running concurrently in the storage system, filtering the reads that would not require the full mapper. So the mapper in the end can be anything. And we have these SSD configurations um, that uh, lower the SSD, which is more cost optimized, medium and high SSD. So this can uh, show different trade offs in terms of uh, performance and cost in the system. And for other details of the methodology, please refer to our paper. We analyzed the benefits of GenStore EM for a 22 gigabyte short read set, where 80% of reads exactly match. Uh, some sequences in the difference genome it can be filtered. So that's a human um, average uh, data case that a lot of sets. So we show the benefits of GenStore on software and hardware read mappers, and it provides up to 22.5 times the speed up compared to software baseline and 3.3 times the speed up compared to the hardware baseline. And on average, uh, 3.92 uh, times energy reduction. And we analyzed GenStore NM uh, for a 12 gigabyte long read set with very high genetic variation uh, compared to the reference genome where 99% of the 7% of the reads do not match any subsequences in the reference genome. And we showed the benefits of GenStore again on software and hardware read mapper for long reads. Uh, show up to 27.9 times the speed up compared to software baseline and 19.2 times the speed up compared to hardware baseline and on average 27.2 times energy reduction. And we find every day on power values of GenStore by synthesizing GenStore EM and NM using 65 nanometer technology node and find that for an 8 channel SSD, the area of GenStore is 0 0.2 millimeter square and the power is 26.6 uh, milliwatts. By scaling uh, the area to lower technology nodes, we observe that the area overhead of GenStore is uh, 0.006% of an Intel processor and less than 9.5% of three ARM cores in a SATA SSD controller. So in more advanced SSD controllers, uh, this uh, ratio would be even smaller because uh, those SSDs have more complex uh, units to perform and uh, maintenance tasks of the SSD. Uh, so I will quickly go over other results that are in the paper before concluding this talk. So these are the analytics the effect of the framework set features such as database deficit sizes and filter ratio. Uh, we show performance benefits of implementation of GPS store outside the SSD. So in some cases, the performance benefits are, uh, it provides performance benefits because of more efficient streaming accesses, uh, but also provides significant little benefit compared to just store implemented inside the SSD. And we also provide more detailed characterization of non-matching reads across different read mapping use cases and species. So to conclude my talk, I go over its summary. Uh, there's a significant effort into improving read mapping performance, but these approaches address a computation overhead or data movement overhead in different parts of the system, but not data movement overhead uh, from the storage. And our goal is to improve performance of GMC plus analysis by effectively reducing unnecessary data movement overhead from the storage system, and our idea is to filter reads that do not require expensive line computation in the storage to fundamentally reduce data movement overhead throughout the system. And the challenges that I address were the different behavior across read mapping workloads and the limited available hardware resources inside the SSD. And GenStore, um, our proposal is the first in storage processing system designed for genome sequence analysis to reduce the computation and then an overhead. And the visual edge also provides a large performance and energy benefits at low cost. So um, that was a uh, talk, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Nika, for that talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, any questions in the room? I may have one. Okay, John has a question. Uh, so, uh, 
Uh, let me take the other one as well. Uh, so you were mentioning the the mechanism of uh, GenStar uh, exact matching, yeah, and you mentioned the I guess the strong hash values over there. I guess they are still like let's say not they are not perfect hash values, so the collisions may still happen. I guess right. So could you uh, briefly talk about like what are the potential concerns or issues when such a collision happens in the exact matching uh, scenario? Uh, plus. I guess right now we're storing the read length, let's say, exact, uh, re basically, yeah, we're storing the read length uh, 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 sequences. Uh, let's say a short read is uh, 100 uh, bases, we're storing them in the hash table or their hash values. Uh, can we increase that length basically further, assuming that the long reads are going to be perhaps like as accurate as the short reads? Uh, if we cannot increase the length, what, what are the main limitations? doing so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great questions. Uh, so I addressed the first one first uh, regarding uh, collisions. So we use the um, cryptographic MD5 hash functions in this case. So the collision rate uh, in our experiments in uh, large read sets were uh, very low. So the exact numbers are um, in the paper I don't have in mind, but uh, so they were uh, really negligible. However, uh, definitely not absolute zero. Uh, and we believe that this is tolerable because of, uh, because uh, usually when we sequence, uh, we have a higher coverage. And uh, the fact that the location, it's a base pair location um, in uh, the genome be covered by several reads, uh, there's a probability for that. So even if a uh, small number of Lesions happen for one read uh, covering that uh, specific base pair in that location, uh, there is high chance that other reads would cover that base pair uh, in uh, uh, the read data set. So um, that's the answer to the first one. So the second question uh, regarding uh, increasing the length, assuming that the long reads would be as accurate. As short reads, I think that this uh, challenge that you mentioned uh, would become even more serious. So that requires more analysis to see at, until which uh, read length uh, this can be feasible. Uh, but the number of unique uh, read length k-mers also would increase significantly, meaning the index size uh, would also significantly increase. So that is a second challenge that would arise rise um, then significantly increasing the read length. Um, I think these need to be looked into, but I uh, uh, think that more advanced uh, designs need to be developed uh, to handle such cases um, separately and directly leveraging just or EF's current design would not be efficient because of uh, the two challenges I discussed. But I think that that would be um, um, interesting question to look into going into future, given that the quality of uh, long reads are improving. Great, yeah, thanks, thanks, Nika. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Nika. I think we're over time and people Pizza need to have some lunch. So, uh, we'll see you later. I think we'll start in one hour, ten minutes. Great, yeah, uh, one to one forty-five. Yeah, it's one forty-five p.m. Istanbul time for the next session. And who's going to present first? Damla. Yeah, Damla is going to present first. And then we have four talks. Okay, see ya. We'll see everyone then.